So obviously Forsaken was the most popular DLC within Destiny history. And many people obviously played it. It was the height of play. It was also when Destiny was still tied to other studios and could produce a lot of content. Now, for some people, some people left right after that and haven't been back in a while. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about what's changed since Forsaken. If you're a returning player, this will give you lots of great information. And if you've even been here you know, more recent like Shadow Keep, there's still some nuggets of information here that are good for you. Also, if you're a new player, this will at least give you some ideas about how some of the systems and how some of the things work in Destiny 2. So even if you're a new player, this could be a valuable video for you. First off, let's talk about the XP system. I will not be going into detail on how the XP system works. If you are curious about this, I have a video first off that talks about how the XP system works. And if you're preparing for next season, I actually have a good video on how the bounty system works and how you can prepare for next season. So check those out. So first off, one of the things that's really changed Destiny 2 is they've really simplified how the leveling system works up. So obviously they always have had kind of a floor and a soft cap and a hard cap. But in addition to that, they added a pinnacle cap. And what that is, is that above the hard cap, there's an additional 10 levels you could get by just playing the current end game content. So that's typically in a season, going to be things like doing the raid or other harder PV or PVP activities. That's also going to be for turning it for playing core playlist activities. Usually it's like a three requirement for getting that. That is going to vary from season to season. But basically, once you get to the hard cap, to get up to the pinnacle cap, you have to do those on your characters and it'll give you usually like one or two bounce in the armor or weapons to kind of level you up. Now, for most players, you don't need to do this. It is a good way to boost and prepare because basically if you do this, the next season, you already be at the hard cap for the next season just because season to season, things only go up by 10. So that is one reason to do it. It also is going to allow you to get into harder content like Grandmasters and Master versions of the raids. So that's one reason you would do this. One of the other things that was implemented was a seasonal pass. So this is similar to seasonal pass you have in games in Fortnite and things like that. Basically, the seasonal pass is something where if you pay for the season, you obviously get certain things automatically for free. And there's some pretty good loot in some of those items. If you don't, you can earn a lot of that stuff, but you actually have to play the game quite a bit to earn it. So again, it just depends if you want the seasonal content. In addition, the seasonal pass will give you materials, will give you um, armor ornaments, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And um, again, we'll give you certain bonuses. So as you get further in the seasonal pass, you'll be able to get bonus XP for doing th th things in different ways. You'll also be able to potentially get bonuses to getting catalyst and earning catalyst for certain exotic weapons that come in the season. So again, that's what the seasonal pass is. And as you level up the seasonal pass, you'll actually be able to unlock things on the seasonal artifact. We'll talk about that in a second. In the past, you've had sort of pursuit weapons. So these were things like the recluse or mountaintop. Those things don't exist anymore. You have ritual weapons now. They're typically a seasonal activity, seasonal quest that allows you to get them. The weapons are pretty good. They're typically tied to bonuses that you're going to see within the season as far as weapon damage and things like that. So they're typically good to do. They'll either be for the current season or for the next season as far as bonuses. Also, if your seasonal pass and XP, you have the ability now to go above, actually infinitely, your power level. So obviously you have your soft cap, you have your hard cap, and you have your pinnacle cap. On top of that, for every certain level of XP you go up and you rank up your seasonal pass, you also get a bonus to your power level. Now, this does go up kind of logarithmically, so it's not just a one-to-one -one ratio. So as, as you level up, it's actually going to require more XP to get your power level higher. But there have been people who've done ridiculous things to level up their power level, most of it for bragging rights, because once you get a certain point in the season, most activities, even if it's the top tier content in the game, does have a cap and you're, you can't exceed that. When you're looking to level up, some, some things have actually changed quite a bit. Again, I have a more detailed video, video where I talk about this, but I will talk about that basically you have seasonal challenges, which give you really a large bonus in XP to the point where you can actually level up an entire seasonal pass level by just doing one seasonal challenge. So the seasonal challenges, you're going to want to try to do all of those. Also, the bounty system has been simplified where instead of trying to figure out everything for different bounties, basically it'll have XP, XP plus, or XP plus plus, which are 4,000, 6,000, or 12,000 XP on each of those bounties. So again, it greatly simplifies how the XP and leveling system works. 
Another thing that was added is Prime Ingram. So there, basically you have a chance to do this. Um, as you kill enough enemies, you will see Prime Ingrams drop. Prime, Prime Ingrams are another way to get sort of powerful, not pinnacle, but powerful rewards that allow you to level up fairly quick. So that's that's something you want to do again. Is the more you play the game, the more chance you have to get those. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, on the Seasonal Pass, there are XP bonuses that you can get at certain levels, whether it's XP bonuses when you're in a fire team, just general XP bonuses. And then the other thing is, on your ghosts, they're modifiable now, and you can get all sorts of different modifications, things that give you more glimmer, but more importantly, you can have ones that give you additional XP on every activity. So again, the XP system in general has been simplified, augmented, the power leveling system is a lot simpler and easier, and honestly, the power grind is not what it used to be. So those things will make the game a lot more enjoyable as you get into Witch Queen. So in addition, depending on what you own, you have the opportunity to get new locations. Obviously the moon came with Shadow Keep. It's a great location, lots of great content. You also have the Cosmodrome. Again, the Cosmodrome came out Beyond Light as well as Europa. So again, two really great um, areas to get. So if you don't have Beyond Light, I would definitely get that. Shadow Keep's a good DLC too. It has good content, but I think for Beyond Light, there's even better. And then obviously if you get the 30th Anniversary Edition, you can get Zura's Realm which gives you access to a lot of other PvE content that will be staying around for a while. But again, if you don't have that, if you're just coming back, that might be something worth getting too. It has a has a dungeon, just there's lots of great content within that. Now let's talk about armor. So for armor, there was an armor 2.0 that basically allowed you to do armor mods. And the armor mods started with really simple mods at the beginning, but then eventually, and I'll talk about these again a little bit more in a video, you can have more complicated mods that allow you to do incredible build crafting. It's actually one of those exciting things in, in the game. If you're interested in how to do build crafting, I have this video where we talk about how and, and how build crafting works in general. In addition, I have an entire playlist of builds. So if you're new, coming back to the game, you don't understand builds. This, these videos will allow you to understand what mods you can put in, how they work with different abilities. And again, you can just make some crazy, crazy, crazy builds that allow you, especially in end game content, to survive or do additional damage. Each of your armors now have affinities, so they're either solar, void, or even stasis now, and arc. Those armor affinities are important because different mods work on different armor affinities. There are some upcoming changes to Witch Queen that will make that easier. Right now, it's kind of a pain. So one of the things you want to pay attention as you get armor drops, especially ones of high stats, is that you're definitely going to want to make sure you get get ones with different affinities because different mods work with different burns on your armor. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of standard mods that you can use. There are Charge of Light mods, which basically means that you need to do different things to basically become Charge of Light. You can do that up to a certain stacking limit. That limit can be increased. With each of those charges, which can, again come from things like collecting orbs or killing things with certain weapons or doing different things. Again, there's a ton of mods for this that if you have this charge of light, then you can do other abilities. So for instance, if you're thinking about protective light, while your charge of light, if your shield gets shot off, then you get additional protection. So there's a ton of mods like that. And if obviously if you're new to the game or returning, you won't have those mods now. You'll be able to get those from vendors and they will come on a rotation. So you'll just have to wait and, and basically get those over time. I have on my, my channel, I have a ton of builds that you can go in and use these. So these are definitely important things to look at. The other thing are Warmind mo Cell Mods. Warmind Cell Mods basically require doing things in a certain way to drop Warmind Cells, or there are Seraph weapons that came from Mars originally that allow you to generate Warmind Cells. So these Warmind Cells will look like little orbs. You can pick them up, you can destroy them, you can leave them on the ground, they have different effects. There are a bunch of mods you can use with these. I have a video here where I talk about Warmind Cells. And again, these are probably the most end game friendly builds. They have been nerfed a little bit, but they still can be utilized to do things like Solium content or working on harder content. And then finally, Elemental Wells. These are more recent from um, Bungie. These I think are gonna continue to become better. They were really poor at first. They got really good um, with some of the later seasons of Beyond Light. And with definitely with rework of Void coming into Destiny, I'm assuming that Elemental Wells mods are just going to continue to be expanded. Elemental Well mods, I have a video here where I talk about them, what the best ones are to get, how they work. So I would definitely check that out. Once you understand sort of the concepts here, then the next thing is kind of getting armor and getting the right armor and getting the ones with the right stats on them. Now, stats were reintroduced in the game again later in the game. And a lot of the stats you need, especially in PvE content, things like recovery, which allows you to regenerate your shields 
or things like resilience, which you can use in PvP, that gives you more hit points. But again, that one's not as useful as recovery. Um, you have mobility, which allows you to stray faster. And then you have your discipline, intellect, and strength, those things which affect how fast your super comes back or how fast you generate your melee ability or how fast you generate your grenades. So the, these are things you're going to have to understand over time. So if you take all these things, whether it's the stats and getting the right stats, again, the best armor for the most part has over 60. That's typically when you know it's a, a, a particularly good piece of armor. You'll have to look at, hey, I want the right burn to my armor so I can do the right mods. And then I want things that are that are high in stats. Once you have all that, that's where you can really get into build crafting. Again, I have a video where I talk about build crafting, which includes tips on how to use the tool DIM, which will allow you to save your builds for future use and to equip that stuff in the game. So again, really good stuff. And then obviously within the game, you'll want to look for places where you can get high stat armor. So typically it's going to vary from year to year, but typically your raids, your harder end game content, Grandmaster GMs, Prime Ingrams, and then typically in each season, there's usually seasonal content that will have higher stat armor. So again, that's going to vary season to season. But if you kind of watch YouTube, my channel, other channels, you'll see typically what are the best farms in each season. Just keep an eye on that as, as each season kind of rolls out. And then finally for armor, they added armor, ornaments, and customization options. So one of the primary reasons for this is people like the hard armor in their vault, right? And so you would see people keeping armor that had actually been sunsetted that can't get above a certain level because they like the look of it or they like different things about it. Now you can actually go in the game and you can use basically picking up certain bounties that allow you to get synth cord and things like that, synth weave, and basically be able to go in and take old pieces of armor that you have and basically turn it into an ornament that you can apply to any piece of armor. So again, that allows you not to have to go in and hoard armor unless you're looking to keep armor for high stats. The other thing is you get a few high stat armor rolls you like, you masterwork them, get them all the way leveled up, and then at that point, you don't have to reinvest and try to do that with multiple pieces of armor. You can just change the ornaments to change the look of what you're doing. And speaking of masterworking armor, that's something you can do to basically level your armor up all the way. It costs materials, it gets expensive towards the end. But with that, it allows you to have more points that you can use for your armor build. So each of your pieces of armor have so many points they can use for the mods that you slot in them. So leveling up that will allow you to use more mods on your characters in their armor. In addition, when it gets completely masterworked, you actually get an extra two stats per thing in the armor, which basically give you plus 12 to your armor overall, which again will allow you to have higher stats for more PV end game PVE or PVP content. Now going from armor, let's talk about what's changed primarily in PVE, and there's a lot that's changed. First off, one of the things that's introduced is called finishers. Now finishers, depending on the if you're on console or you're on PC, obviously they have different methods for doing this on console. It's, you know, pressing down on your stick basically to finish it off. What this is, is you've done a little bit of damage to actually most of the damage to an enemy and they'll see like a, a yellow dot on top of them. And once you do that, then basically when you do the finisher, you completely kill them. Now, this can also trigger not only killing them, obviously, and sometimes when you're low on health, this is a good way to allow yourself to actually regen your health a little bit while you're doing this. But the other thing is, there are certain abilities, there are things that will allow you to get charges with light, there are things that will allow you to get different ammo drops, so finishers can actually be a key component of your build. The other thing that's been added are champions. So champions, you have overload, you have barrier, and you have unstoppable. Barrier, again, are interesting in that um, when you do about a third of damage to them, you'll see bars on them, so you'll be able to determine where that's at. When you do a third damage to them, they'll put up a shield, and if you don't shoot the shield off and stun them quickly enough, they'll actually regen all their health. So the big thing with barrier is they'll also shield other enemies, so they can be really, really annoying. The, the big key, I would say, with barriers is once they put the shield up, is just make sure with whatever weapon you have for barrier that season, that you at least do continual damage to them. So it's important whether you and your fire team to make sure you've reloaded those weapons because that can kind of trip you up. And those barriers can actually then, they can actually block off um, and shield other champions, other enemies, which again makes it really annoying. Unstoppable are not too bad except they will, they're unstoppable. They will continue to come at you. So 
For those, again, whatever weapon it is for that season, you go and you stun them, and then um, you try to take them down as quickly as possible, because once they unstun, they're going to start coming at you again really quickly, and they can become overwhelming. The one good thing about Unstoppable, which makes them not too bad to deal with, again, except for the fact that they'll run you down, um, one of the things that makes them a little easier is that they do not regenerate health no matter what. So after you stun them and you do more damage to them, they will never regen health. So that comes in really handy. The final one are Overloads. Overloads are extremely annoying, primarily because the stunning mechanism on them is a little flaky and sometimes takes a little bit to regen. They also will warp all over the place, which makes uh, pinning them down difficult. So that is being reworked, so it should be better coming up with the Witch Queen, hopefully. But the big thing with Unstoppables is as soon as you stun them, you're going to do as much damage, at least get them down the finisher level where maybe you can finish them as quickly as possible. Because if they if they warp, they can warp behind you, they can warp the other side, you may not see them, and they very quickly regen their health. So they're extremely, extremely annoying. Another thing that's changed is uh, Legend or Master Law Sector. So these are like your normal Law Sectors, except they add champions to them, and they're different power levels. So the primary reason you want to do these is if you do them solo, you actually get a chance the armor, the exotic armor that was released in Beyond Light, the new armor, for the most part, is primarily gotten through this ability. So instead of just getting random world drops with some of these, you basically have to do these solo to get a chance of it. And it's a chance. It's, it's a pretty good chance. It comes up pretty quickly. But the big difference between Legend and Master is going to be the difficulty, the power level, whether they have more champions or things like that. So, though you know, the Legend is where I try to get to if you're just trying to get some of these exotics but these are really good exotics things like Aminoculus and other you know hunter warlock and titan exotics so you could check those out to see what they are but that's the primary way of getting those and those lost sectors go on a rotation across the different planets next we'll kind of talk about what's happened with dungeons so there's a ton of dungeons depending on what you own there's pit of heresy that came out with shadow keep pit of heresy is a fun dungeon it's fairly, if you have a good fire team, it's fairly easy to get through fairly quickly, but it's not too bad. There's Prophecy. This is an incredibly fun dungeon. It's not just the fact that it's fun, but the theme, the way it's paced, the music, everything else. This makes this one of the best dungeons I've ever played. Again, with Pity Heresy and Prophecy and the other dungeons, they come with unique loot. So whichever season you're in, you'll have to pay attention to what that is. But that's one of the reasons. And most of them are farmable, which allows you to run them multiple times and be able to get you know different roles on loot. There's a Grasp of Avarice. Grasp of Avarice is only available if you own the 30th Anniversary Edition. And so that's obviously something you would have to purchase if you want to play it. It's a ton of fun. Um, it's something that's one of the easier um, dungeons to actually go through in solo. So again, if you're into dungeons, that sort of thing, I would definitely do that. Nightfall's been revamped a great deal within Destiny 2 also. So Nightfall's now called the Nightfall Ordeal. There's different levels, and these also happen with some of the other activities. So there's Adept, Hero, Legend, Master, and Grandmaster. Now, Grandmaster is unique to Ordeal Strikes, so that's not something you have in some of the other activities. So I would say for the most part, the lower levels have matchmaking and don't have a lot of modifiers. The higher you get up, it's the higher power levels. You're also going to have more champions, and you're going to have additional modifiers put on top of you. Grandmasters are the ultimate pinnacle activity within strikes, and one of the reasons you would do these is that there are routinely times where Bungie does double loot, and the loot on a Grandmaster, if you complete it in a certain amount of time, is incredible. You're typically going to get an exotic. You're going to get shards and prisms. You're going to get a ton of things that you're going to need for build crafting. So if you have an opportunity, and Master gives you some of that too, but Grandmaster definitely is stepping up the game. Grandmaster is a very high level, so you obviously have to level up quite a bit. You will get one shot by a lot of items, so you're going to need to make sure you have a good build and a good fire team to complete these. And they're actually time limited in that you get so many revives every time you kill champions. When you're on revives, you die, and then you can't be revived. If you run out of time, then even if you had all those revives, you're actually gonna your timer is gonna run out, and you won't have any additional revives. So again, it's a very high level activity. If you want to get into this, I would definitely go into the Legend and Master Lost Sectors too to kind of get an idea of how that mechanism works, because there's a similar timing mechanism in those, and that will also let you get some of the exotic loot that you need. Within each new expansion, you also have the concept of hunts, and those are typically again those are things where in the season or in the the DLC. Those are typically things where you can get powerful or pinnacle rewards depending on the week and depending on what's going on. For the two DLCs in question where these happen, 
you have Nightmare Hunts that are within Shadowkeep, and you have Empire Hunts with are in Beyond Light. And so those have modifiers on them like Master, Legend, everything else. They have loot, and depending on the but depending on where they are as far as being the active C, the active DLC, you'll actually be able to get pinnacles or powerful out of those as well. Battlegrounds is an activity that came in one of the seasons within Beyond Light, and it's something that we remain. It's think about this. It's basically a very high ad concentrated activity with champions and a boss. It usually doesn't once you get the the hang of it. It usually doesn't take a long time to get through. One of the things that's nice is that you can actually use this to work on catalysts and things like that because there's a ton of ads. There's tons of things that you can kill. So it works great with Catalyst. And then typically there's a chest where you can get some loot. As far as strikes, there was Fallen Saber and Devil's Lair that were added from Destiny 1. There's also Scarlet Keep that came with Shadow Keep. That's a fun strike. There's Disgraced, which is basically a revamp strike from Destiny 1. And there's the Glass Way that came with Beyond Light. And as far as raids, if you're into raids, there's a ton of great raids that came out. There is Garden of Salvation that came out with Shadowkeep, which is probably a little bit more mechanically difficult. But if you have a good fire team, it's definitely a good raid. There's some decent loot in there, but again, this is one that's probably not as liked as much by the community. There's Deepstone Crypt, which is a fun raid. It's fairly short once you get a good fire team knows what they're doing. It has some very unique encounter mechanics. Again, just like most raids. But this one, like thematically, is a very fun raid. People who are more hardcore probably think of this as a raid that's too easy, especially if you, you know, have a fire team knows what they're doing. But again, it's a fun raid. It's got really good loot. That's one thing I would give credit for it also. Then Vault of Glass came back from Destiny 1. Vault of Glass, they've revamped it a little bit. Vault of Glass from Destiny 1 has become very stale. Um, you know, for the modern sandbox, if you go into Destiny 1, you play Vault of Glass, you can just breeze right through it. But now, they it's still an easier raid, but they've added some mechanics that make it a little bit more difficult. I won't spoil that here. I do have some videos on some of the uh, challenges and things within uh, Vault of Glass, if you'd like to check those out. But it's definitely fun, and there's some pretty good loot out of this raid, too. So in addition, when you're looking to power up, one of the things that's changed a great deal is what activities will give you powerful versus pinnacle rewards. Now, what I'm about to tell you will change over time, but I'm trying to make this as generic as possible so that over time, you'll also be able to understand how this works in future seasons. So first off, for powerful activities, a number of runs through activities such as the seasonal events, nightfall and trials, getting exotics, seasonal weapon quests, which season has a weapon quest, running through eight bounties and things like the Gunsmith, Vanguard, Crucible, Gambit, and then whatever plan it is for that DLC. Reputation updates. So basically, as you go up in level for your reputation for a vendor, so let's say Crucible, for both comp and non-comp, you get these. In Gambit and Strikes, you get this as well. Clan rewards, which you get from Hawthorne. Exotic quests. Legend and Master Lost Sector exotics non-boss encounters in dungeons. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the primary dungeon. I'm talking about typically if you have a, a DLC that has two dungeons, they'll have the concept of having a primary dungeon. That's the one that's out actively. And then when a new one comes out, they'll kind of move back the rewards on whatever is the secondary, whatever was out first. And you'll see this across other PvE activities. You also get prime engrams. You get these from just playing the game. You are limited to how many you can get per week, but honestly, for the most part, I just get Prime Engrams rained on me on a regular basis, so I don't think it's a big deal. Encounters, again, in the secondary raid from the DLC. So if you have two raids, whatever's the active one, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But encounters in the secondary raid, those are going to get powerfuls. And then other DLC-specific items. So that's stuff like, to give you some examples, that's stuff like the Hunts or the Exo Challenger, Exo Stranger from Beyond Light. So again, whatever the DLC-specific items are, those will typically give you powerful rewards. And a lot of these can also be upgraded to Pinnacle. We'll talk about that in a second. So for Pinnacle, so again, once you get to your, your cap, the only way to get above that, that extra 10, is through Pinnacles, which again, sets you up next for the following season. So the seasonal activities, whatever season you're in, there's always going to be some Pinnacle rewards from that. The bosses of Dungeons are always going to have, again, on the active one, are always going to have a pinnacle reward. Iron Banner bounties are also going to have this, so you can get four of those per run. Sometimes they have more bounties through the season because obviously you have more Iron Banner coming out. So these are great ways, not just to store up and get XP, but also to get pinnacle rewards. Your Clan Weekly XP, so again, that's just from playing the game. A reset of Glory Rank. Playthroughs every week of Gambit, Crucible, strikes 
and trials. Those things will give you pinnacle rewards. Exotic quests. So when I'm saying exotic quests, things like in the current year, presage and things like that. So I'm not sure in the future what Bungie's gonna do with that, but currently those are things that you can do to get pinnacle rewards. Nightfall the Ordeal on points. So this is getting over 100,000 points. That'll give you a pinnacle. DLC specific items. So again, we talked about the hunts and other things, exo challenges. You can upgrade these too. So a master hunt in the current season, that'll give you a pinnacle. And the exo challenges, if you do them in a certain way, those will also give you pinnacles. The currently active raid, all those four encounters will give you pinnacles as well, which is, again, if you get a good fire team and you know how to do these things on a regular basis, that's a great way to get loot. It's obviously easier than doing Iron Banner bounties, for instance, which take you a lot longer to get to those bounties. The active seasonal activity almost always will have some sort of way of getting pinnacles. And then the active dungeon. So again, these are ways you can get powerful and pinnacle rewards. It will change over time. I'll put updated videos when it happens. But if you pay attention to these as you're going up like your hard cap and then your pinnacle cap, these are things that you can do every week. And I will say, once you get to that hard cap, you can still do those activities. But the only thing that's going to upgrade you is Pinnacle. So you need to start thinking through that as you think about the new XP system. So with Stasis coming, Stasis obviously is a, a new type. It's wielding the darkness, basically. And with Stasis, which a lot of people hated at first, one of the things that changed is they're trying to diversify how you can get and how you can tweak your subclasses. So remember Destiny 1, it was, it was like a grind, but you had tons of options. Well, the compromise is, in Destiny 2, it's a lot easier, but you don't have a ton of options. You're kind of setting what they want. With Aspects and Fragments, there's still a little bit of grind. It's not as bad as Destiny 1. But with the Aspects and Fragments, it allows you to do different things with your grenades. Like, for instance, the Warlock, you can make a turret out of your grenades, right? It allows you for different effects to happen on your character. So if something happens to you, then you're going to get a buff. Or you're going to be able to debuff things again. And you'll be able to interchange those with the points that you have. Now, in Witch Queen, the same thing will be happening with the Void subclass. So there'll be a lot of changes. But Stasis specifically started this. And again, there are quests that you have to run and complete to get all those aspects and fragments. So that's kind of a grind. But once you have them, you can do some crazy builds. I have some builds on my channel. Check them out. Some of my Stasis builds. Where you can basically, on the different characters, you can do some incredible things by marrying different types of aspects and fragments together to be able to do things you normally wouldn't be able to do in the game. There are new ways to play in Destiny 2. So first off, New Light. New Light is a way where you can do free to play, similar to Fortnite or other games. Now, with New Light, it's kind of a rough player experience if you're new, but just, it's kind of disjointed, but it is a way to get in the game, and play a lot of the core activities. Now, the only bad thing about that is you probably need to figure out what platform you're going to be on because you have to let's say you're a new light player and you want to play shadow keep yeah you you want to play on a playstation you can't play shadow keep then on your pc and we'll talk about it in a little bit unless you also purchase it on that other platform so the one great thing about it is if you're you know if you're a playstation player and you're on vacation you have your laptop with you or if you have stadia um you'll still be able to go in and do basic activities even though you don't own the DLC. So you want to run strikes, crucible, things like that, you'll still be able to do it. So that's that's really a nice thing. And it allows to bring more people in the community. Crossplay. So this allows you to basically be able to play with any player in any platform. And it's it's really slick how it works. Now, one of the things they have done is that you can opt out when you're doing fire team matchmaking and things like that, that you basically make sure, like for instance, in Crucible, you can actually say, hey, I don't want to match up with people who are on other platforms, right? Because that can be really unfair if you're mouse and keyboard versus console. And that's the primarily way they do that is the controller versus mouse and keyboard. But crossplay allows you to not have to worry about what platform people are on when you're setting up an activity, which helps out for getting people, especially if you know you have a friend that plays on PC and you want to play, you can do that now. Stadia. Stadia is a Google-based uh, service where basically Destiny is played on their servers and you if you have a fast internet connection you basically play on their server so the great thing about this is it's browser based you can basically do it anywhere um, you just need to have a fast internet connection so it's a certain amount of money in, uh, per a month I think it's like 10 bucks or something like that so again if you were on vacation and all of a sudden you want to boot up the game or something like that that would be a way to get in there now obviously you still need to own the game unless you just want to do the new light activities but it's still a nice option. Steam, so Bungie moved everything after they split from Activision 
from Battle.net and from Blizzard over to Steam. And so, you know, that probably aligns better with what most people do for their PC gaming anyway. The other thing that's happened is that if you own Destiny 2, um, basically if you have a next-gen console, let's say like a PS5 or something like that, there's a free update that you have to re-download the entire game, but it allows you to play at higher FPS and higher field of view. It, it's it's crazy actually, because it, it, the game looks like it does on a PC. It basically means there's no difference, to be honest, you'd be playing on a PC and playing on a console. You have the same visual effects, you move a lot faster. So again, that's one of the reasons that people really like this and it, it's free, so you should get that if you can. And finally, one of the things that was really limiting Destiny 2 from doing crossplay was in-game vo voice chat, which they released at first and was really bad. Now it's pretty good and I use it exclusively. What this means is if you're a PC player, okay, and if you're a console player, you can basically use Bungie-based chat to communicate with anyone. That doesn't mean opening up a PSN chat or going in, you know, using Discord or something like that. You can do all your player matchmaking, you know, join up through the app, and then you can basically at that point just use the building game function to play the game, which really helps, again, if you're looking for people and you can only find people on certain uh, platforms. So let's talk about Crucible as well. Crucible has been kind of under developed within Destiny 2. Um, it's been kind of, you know, PV has been the focus, which is fine. It's primarily a PV game, but there have been quite a few improvements. So first off, three versus three was added, which that's primarily for your skill-based modes and things like survival, trials, which again was a great improvement because three versus three just feels a little smoother. And it's, to me, especially if you're playing like not on mic and things like that, it's a lot easier to coordinate that than six people skill-based matchmaking so skill-based matchmaking was added and it's been it had been changed multiple times but the primary reason for this is so that if you're someone who's trying to get into survival for instance you're trying to get better you don't necessarily you match with people who are close to where you are and then you really quickly the game basically gets you to play against people who are like you so you're not playing against people who are complete noobs you're also not kind of playing against sweat lords all the time so now there's complaints because people who are sweat lords always are playing against sweat lords and i get that but there's other modes where skill-based matchmaking is turned off so they have other alternatives so i actually think it's one of the greatest things in the game then trials trials came back and it was revamped i think they've gotten to a pretty good place with trials they've added things like a freelance same thing in survival for instance where you can play solo they've tweaked some of the reward systems so people weren't you know high-end players were not just sitting there and stomping on low-level players to get rewards so again i think it's in a pretty good place there's some pretty good guns you can get out of it so even if you're a casual pvp player i definitely something you should try momentum control was added so momentum control basically you don't get your supers as quick and you do a lot more damage with weapons so for instance let's say you have jade rabbit in the back of the map you can one tap people with that the other thing you don't have is radar so you can kind of sneak around and do some crazy things with people people aren't paying attention. So that's a fun mode. A lot of people use it for finishing up catalysts and things like that. It's also usually fairly quick if you're working on bounties or other things for the week. Elimination. Elimination was, again, a 3v3 mode. That was the precursor to bring trials back. You get kind of the concept. So that's another fun one that was added. They're now rotators. So modes rotate in and out every week. So that allows for some variety. And then again, as I talked about before, Freelance. Freelance was added for IR Banner, Trials, and Survival. And this allows you basically to come in as a single player and only play against single players versus playing against teams on mic and things like that. All right, let's now talk about the thing that most people probably don't want to talk about, and that's the DCV. So there's the Destiny Content Vault, which basically allows, and you, you can go either way on this, but it basically allows Destiny to remain relevant in that the game can only get so big and only be maintained in so many ways, right? The more stuff is out there, the more it costs to maintain, the larger the game gets. So they routinely retire certain activities. And it does get frustrating because there are things you paid for. But at the same time, you go back and look at what they're retiring. It's like, I don't do that stuff anyway. So that's one of the things over time. So they can you expand the game. They vault things over time. And there are times where they're looking at potentially to bring things out of the vault. They did that with Prophecy, for instance. So there's a possibility some of this stuff could come back. The other thing with the DCV is some of it is tied to story. So based on where the story is going, the retire activities are no longer relevant for the story. So first off, areas that have been retired include Mercury, Titan, Io, and Mars. Then related to that, you have areas like the Farm, Leviathan, the Whisper Mission, the Zero Hour Mission that have also been retired. So again, 
some stuff that you, you like and would love to come back, but things do come back. So for instance, for Witch Queen, Mars is coming back. I don't think it's the Mars that was vaulted. That's my guess. It's probably gonna be a little bit different. But again, some things can come back over time, but those are the things. Specifically, the biggest things for me are probably Leviathan, Whisper, and Zero Hour because for Leviathan, it had a lot of good good things added to it, which I'll talk about in a minute. But for those missions, I love Whisper and Zero Hour. But, you know, again, progress has to be made. In addition, uh, Gambit's been consolidated back down to one mode. Um, there's pluses or minuses to it. It's not bad the way they've done it. It will be redone a little bit of Witch Queen. So, I'll again, I'll post an updated video when we talk about and understand what that looks like. With that, maps including Cathedral of Scars and Kell's Grave have been retired as well. From a Crucible perspective, Supremacy, Countdown, Lockdown, Breakthrough, and Doubles were all retired. So again, most of those modes we weren't really playing on a regular basis. There's a couple that I like. For instance, I like Supremacy. So again, there's some stuff that would be good. Absolutely hated Countdown. So again, there's some good and some bad with that. From a maps perspective, Meltdown, Solitude, Retribution, The Citadel, Emperor's Respite, Equinox, Eternity, Firebase Echo, Gambler's Ruin, Legion's Gulf, and Vostok were all retired. Again, earlier we talked about Leviathan. So Leviathan obviously is a raid was retired. Eater of Worlds inspired since they're raid layers within Leviathan. Crown was retired because again, same reason. And then Scourge was retired. Obviously, this one was a little more difficult for me to swallow because there were some fun raids in there. But again, I understand what Bungie has to do. Many exotics were moved to an exotic quest archive. I won't go over all of them, but those require spoils that you get from the raids or other materials to get them back. So there are ways to get those things back. In fact, it allows some people to get things that maybe they were difficult for them to get just because they were difficult to get within the raids or other things like that. But all the exotics, you can't get back in one way or the other. From a story perspective, the Red War campaign, Trials of Osiris and Warmind were all retired. So again, that's part of the problem with the experience now. So as you have new players joining, there's things they're not going to understand context around. So again, I understand why, but that's a little bit difficult. I used to love to play story missions and things like that. That's something we can't do anymore. Related to some of the other things retiring of the areas, that means some other modes that are on those planets have been retired. So things like Escalation Protocol, the Black Armory Forges, the Mercury Forges, Menagerie, the Tribute Hall, Reckoning and Niobe Lamps. Now, outside the outside the raids, this is probably the most difficult for one for me. So for instance, for Tribute Hall, that was a great place to do builds, right? To test things out. I, I That's one I, I still don't understand why Budgie didn't put something else in there. Some of the other planetary activities like Escalation Protocol, the Forges, again, great things. The Reckoning, I know people hated the Reckoning. I actually liked it. It was quite a bit of fun. Now, if you had a bad fire team, I get that, but I liked it quite a bit. So again, and if you have never played Naomi Labs, you can't. Now, that was very, that was the thing I did once, never did one to do again. But if you did that, or if you haven't done that, that's something you'll never be able to do again. So that one was kind of difficult to swallow, but it is what it is. So for strikes, things like, again, Tide to Worlds, Garden World, Tree of Possibilities, Sabathun Song, Pyramidian, Strange Terrain, and Will of Thousands were also retired. And then from Vendor's perspective, same sort of thing. Benedict 66, Warner, Anna, Sloan, Asher, Brother Vance, and Visage were all retired. And all of those, they had ways to tie them off at the end of the season. So that was good, at least. You kind of understood. And it's possible some of them can come back. Like Ada 1, for instance, disappeared at one point and she came back. So again, there are things that Bungie has to do. Vendors are probably the least important thing for me. So again, it'd be nice to have some of them back. But again, I completely understand. So that's a video, guys. Kind of a long one. But again, if you have not played since Forsaken, this is a good way to understand what's changed. This will even be good, for instance, if you haven't played since Destiny Year One, because some of this will give you an update on some things that have changed, or even Shadow Keep. So again, I will be putting out some future videos as we get into Witch Queen to talk about changes and things like this. But I thought we're going to have a lot of new players coming in. It's very confusing. Destiny does not do a really good job. Bungie doesn't do a really good job of explaining what's changed and why certain things are gone. I mean, there, there are times where I even I forget, oh wait, that's no, that's not there anymore, I can't do it. I understand they have web pages, I understand they have facts, but again, overall, Bungie and Destiny have had a very convoluted development process from day one, and there's been a lot of changes at the studio, and I understand that, but I think it's very difficult for players who come back to kind of understand, which over time hurts the community and hurts people staying because they come back and like, I don't understand, why did all this stuff change? So hopefully this video gives you some context. If you have any other questions, feel free to you know drop them in my uh, comments here. I can definitely talk about them. Feel free to also join my Discord. The link to where the Discord is, 
in the description of the video. And again, if you really like this, provide value to you, feel free to like the video and subscribe to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. Check out my other videos and I'll see you guardians in the tower.